Hi there, everyone. Just wanted to say thank you so much for joining me today. I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on measuring the effects of changing winter lengths on reproductive allocation and preparation in pumpkin seed sunfish. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto, and I'm supervised by Dr. Bailey McNeens. And before I get started, I just wanted to give a quick acknowledgement to everybody who made this project possible. First and foremost would be Dr. Brian Shooter. He was really the one who designed the experiment itself. He carried it out uh, in 1980, 15 years before I was even born. So really this is a, a, mostly a data talk, but it's amazing how a project from so long ago can unveil things that we really haven't even seen yet today. Uh, and again, Dr. Peter Eason, who was uh, an assistant of Dr. Brian Shooter at the time at the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and my supervisor, Dr. Bailey McNeese. Big shout out to them for making this possible. So first we'll just go over a quick outline. So we'll go over centrarchids in cold water. So we're talking about warm water fish and how they cope with winter itself and what shorter winters might mean for warm water fish that do spawn in the spring. And then we'll go over some questions and hypotheses, the study design itself, and then how winter length, or at least simulated winter length, did affect pumpkin seed reproduction. And we'll talk about then some conclusions and implications. So first, winter is really characterized in north temperate areas, at least, by ice covered lakes. So we have ice and snow uh, that hit the surface and limit oxygen transfer between that water air interface. In terms of how fish do during this time, because of the stable cold temperatures, cold water fish have always really been thought to excel during this period. So remaining active, feeding, acquiring energy in some cases instead of losing it. Winter has really been the realm of cold water fish, or at least that's what we've thought. Warm water fish, on the other hand, have been thought to really shut down during winter months as resource availability decreases and temperatures fall out of their optimal range. Warm water fish have been proposed to enter a quiescent state, or basically an aquatic hibernation. And this is further substantiated by observations that warm water fish, like bass, have limited northern distributions as a result of the longer winters at those latitudes. And so here, I'm just going to be showing you a map of Ontario with distribution of smallmouth bass in, or presence absence of smallmouth bass in lakes throughout Ontario. Green here represents the presence of smallmouth bass, and yellow and orange represent the absence. And as you can see, as we move northwards, as winters get longer and as summers get colder, we see increased absence or decreased presence of smallmouth bass in Ontario lakes. That being said, with telemetry as well as with some video examples, as I'm showing here, we know that fish are not stagnant in the winter months. These fish are moving around, they form winter aggregations, as you shortly see. And also physiologically, we know that they cannot survive on the energy stores they go into winter with alone. They have to forage, they have to supplement these energy reserves. And if you ask any ice fishermen, of course, they'll tell you that they've caught bass through the ice, further substantiating the fact that these fish are feeding. And usually when an ice fisherman catches one, they're going to catch much more because of these aggregation sites. So this is a leak just outside of Collingwood. And as you can see, the fish are quite responsive, even given these winter temperatures. So we know that fish have to supplement into energy reserves. They have to forage under the ice. But to make it even worse, as soon as the ice melts, the surface water opens up and water temperatures start to warm right after this extremely stressful, thermally limited, resource limited period, which we call winter, these fish are now gearing up to spawn. So warm water sunfish, whether they be pumpkin seed, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, and bluegill, they all spawn come springtime. So this is an example from pumpkin seed sunfish. Uh, on the y-axis on the left, we have the percent spawning, and on the right, we have the mean gonadosomatic index, which is just a representation of the relative size of the gonads. And so come May, Right after I saw in this population of pumpkin seed sunfish, which is actually from Peterborough, we see them increasing allocation towards the gonads. So the relative size of the gonads is increasing in the spring, so they are diverting, actively diverting energy towards reproduction during this time. 
regardless of the fact that they just came out of a very energetically stressful period, which is winter. And now, lakes in north temperate regions, as well as arctic regions, are starting to experience earlier ice off. So a shortening winter in our northern populations. But what we don't know is how these shorter winters influence spring spawning temperate fish. So here I'm asking the question, what do shorter winters mean for spring spawning temperate species? Well, first we have to better understand spawning cue. So wh what are these fish queuing into in order to start allocating towards reproduction or preparing for it? We know that photoperiod or length of day as indicated by the number of hours between sunrise and sunset is very important for fish spawning. It's thought to entrain the reproductive cycle in temperate species and in many other species as well because it's very reliable. It doesn't vary very much from year to year like temperature. That being said, it needs to be combined with increases in temperature for sunfish specifically. When you get this nice combination of increasing day length and increasing temperature, you see maximized reproductive output. These increasing temperature and photoperiod conditions are characteristic of the springtime, and that is why in the spring, we, that's when we see pumpkin seed and bluegill, shown here, spawning on the nests as well as nest guarding. But now spawning cues are changing as a result of the shortening winters. Photoperiod is not necessarily shifting. It's in fact temperature that we're starting to see change. So here, uh, this is a figure from a paper by Farmer and colleagues in 2015. On the y-axis, we have water temperature, and on the x-axis, we have month. So this just illustrates really nicely the difference between early spring warming, or short winter, as shown in, by the red line here, and a long winter, or late spring warming, as shown by the black and turquoise line. With this combination of consistent photoperiod and changing spring warming conditions, where in short winters, surface water temperatures up to 15 degrees are being reached two months earlier than previously expected, we really don't know how this is going to affect fish reproduction for spring spawners. So here I ask, what are the explicit roles of temperature and photoperiod in queuing reproductive allocation? And secondly, how does winter length influence reproductive allocation and preparation? For the sake of this talk, we'll be focusing on question two, just for the sake of time. So first we'll go into explaining a little bit of the experimental design. In the fall of 1979, 800 pumpkin seed sunfish were collected from a pond in southern Ontario, and they were brought into an experimental facility where they were held in a large tank so beginning at this time, these fish were exposed to simulated natural conditions. So from fall to winter, the temperature was decreased at the natural rate, and the day length was also decreased at the natural rate. Come winter time, these fish were exposed to increasing day length conditions. And this is where our experimental sampling from this tank occurred. As day length increased in the holding tank, temperature was held at 4 degrees Celsius. Sampling occurred at discrete day length, so for example, at 9 and 10 day length hours, but also 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 hours of day length. Because of the consistent holding of the tank at 4 degrees Celsius, day length is analogous to winter length. So the longer the day length, the longer the simulated winter length. After target day lengths were reached in the holding tank, 60 fish were moved from the holding tank into different experimental tanks. As a result, we had experimental tanks that were associated with different simulated winter lengths. In these experimental tanks, day length was held constant and fish were split up into four different sample groups. Each experimental tank underwent a simulated spring warming where temperatures were brought from four degrees Celsius up to 20 degrees Celsius at the natural rate. And these four fish samples were taken at different temperatures during that warming period. The first occurred before any warming, so while the tank was still at 4 degrees Celsius, the second at 12 degrees Celsius during the warming, the third at 20 degrees, and the fourth after 11 days at 20 degrees. First, we'll talk about how simulated winter length affected reproductive preparation. 
In sunfish, reproductive preparation occurs in the liver. As liver size increases in the early spring, we see increased rates of synthesis of egg constituent proteins, as well as increased accumulation of neutrolipids that will be transferred to the gonads for, during reproductive allocation. These plots illustrate hepatosomatic index on the y-axis as a function of day length at warming on the x. And again, day length at warming is analogous to winter length. So as we move right along the x-axis, we have increased simulated winter length. And hepatosomatic index is just a relative measure of the size of the liver. So with increased hepatosomatic index, we have increased relative liver size. And for the purposes here, sample number represent different temperature exposures, and we'll focus on sample number one, so before any warming occurred during that four degrees Celsius stable period. Data for male fish are presented here on the left, and if we focus in on the black line, so at sample one, before any warming has occurred, what we notice is that male fish are responding to day length alone with respect to allocation towards the liver. So as winter length increases, these fish are responding by increasing their relative liver sizes to day length alone while under consistent four degree conditions. This pattern is consistent in females shown on the right, as when we follow the black line or sample one before any warming, we see increased reproductive preparation as reflected through increased hepatosomatic index with response to day length alone. But how does this translate to reproductive allocation? Now these plots will represent reproductive allocation as represented by gonadosomatic index on the y-axis as a function of day length at warming again or winter length. Uh, this time we'll focus on sample three which will be the blue line uh, which reflects the maximal reproductive allocation period. And what we see in males is as winter length increases if we follow sample three, which is our maximum gonadosomatic index or reproductive allocation, it increases with simulated winter length. This trend is reflected in females as well. When we follow our sample three blue line, we see increased gonadosomatic index with increased winter length. So how does winter length influence reproductive allocation and preparation? Well, as we've seen, as we've seen earlier spring warming, at day lengths 9 and 10 elicit delayed hepatic preparation. Identifying a threshold value at 11 hours of day length, where before this point we see no hepatic preparation in response to day length alone. Delayed preparation relative to simulated spring warming also elicited reduced allocation as represented by the gonadosomatic index. So again, before our threshold of 11 hours, we see much significantly reduced reproductive allocation relative to longer winter lengths. In conclusion, earlier onset of warming or shorter winters cause a misalignment of photothermal cues. As winters shorten and we start to see earlier and earlier ice off dates, we may expect decreased fisheries production as a result of decreased reproductive preparation. Here, hepatic preparation has been shown to respond to photoperiod alone, but also be necessary for reproductive allocation. Reproductive allocation appears to respond most strongly to temperature, but only after exposure to a minimum photoperiod. As winters shorten and we start to decrease the day length exposure during late winter, we might start to see constrained fisheries production as a result of a lack of that photoperiod stimulus. How this misalignment of photothermal cues affects resource abundance and resource pulses, like things like salamander abundance in lakes, which could compound with decreased hepatic preparation, we still do not know. And with that, I would just like to say thank you so much for your time, and here are my references for the talk. All the best.